Thank you again, Dr. Silva, and thank you um, to everyone. Um, thank you to the um, to the organizers of this event for giving me the opportunity to present my work. I actually um, I'm a DMP prepared nurse, but I'm also in the um, in a in a research track training right now at Augusta University. So um, I'm also a I'm also a faculty with um, Dr. Wyatt at um, Kennesaw State University. So uh, <clears throat> this study was actually a, a, um, a kind of a pilot to precede my, um, my future um, dissertation on the use of technology in the care of patients in, um, in healthcare. So again, um, <clears throat> this is just to kind of introduce me to that. And, and again, in previously, um, I, I, I mean, um, in my in my DMP project, I actually worked with um, how to, uh, with I um, I did a it's the study was on um, the use of technology, but the safe use of technology, and and that specific uh, project was basically um, how to uh, how to prevent overrides and how to prevent injuries when when nurses do overrides. But that was. Um, in my DMP study, but now I'm looking at the different ways to use technology to enhance um, care, especially in the chronic disease uh, population. So again, we do know that <clears throat> a lot of people are people are living longer, and with longevity comes the problem with um, you know chronic diseases. And so, and the chronic diseases because um, you know uh, in 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 the middle of managing pro chronic diseases, a lot of patients will be hospitalized, they will seek healthcare even more often than those who don't have those diseases. And the implications of that is the cost of, um, of seeking healthcare. So um, clinicians and also healthcare facilities are looking at ways to reduce, to minimize costs. And so what they, what they are looking into is um, technology-based interventions. And with the technology-based interventions, the patient will need to accept or adopt the device that is going to be used. And also providers will also need to buy in to prescribing those um, specific, um, those specific um, interventions. And um, so in, in doing so, <clears throat> I started to look at um, the specific population, which is the heart failure population. And because we know our failure is a progressively, um, you know, um, it's, a, it's a chronic disease that does re that really costs a lot of money. And the um, in back in 2021, there was a study that conducted and um, that was conducted to kind of figure out how much it cost um, at our failure patients during exacerbation and and monitoring in the hospital. And they came up with this figure. A two thousand about two thousand six hundred per day for this um, for a patient to be monitored um, in the uh, in the healthcare setting if they have exacerbation. Um, if we if we look at if we um, conversely if we look at moni like monitoring that same patient remotely in their in their um, in their homes with uh, with electronic device it costs about one hundred and twenty five dollars to one hundred and fifty dollars per month to monitor the same patient. That's just like a huge um, you know, difference. So in doing that, <clears throat> it's, it's relevant to seek, the, um, to seek the views of healthcare providers who manage these patients to examine some of the, um, some of the um, you know, obstacles and even benefits that we can use to promote patient adoption and also to, um, that, that um, also obstacles that may require maybe some adjustments in a, uh, in a way to um, to drive patient acceptance, and so um, if we if we look on my uh, if we look on the right side of the uh, of my screen, there's the live vest. So this live vest, this specific one, um, which I uh, which I actually um, conducted my study on, um, was used as a or is used as a undergarment. So the patient will put that on, will, will wear that under their um, under their dressing, but um, it it has like a kind of a um, software um, kind of um, uh, device that is attached to the gamut, and the software device um, enables the um, 
the pay, uh, enables clinicians or um, facilitates the collection of the patient's heart rate. Uh, it monitors the patient's rhythm or um, even uh, physical activities such as, um, such as how many steps they've taken per day. And also um, it has a cardioverdible uh, feature in it where if the patient um, has a cardio, uh, a um, tachyarrhythmia that is becoming lethal, the, um, the device will spring into action and um, deliver a shock to the patient, similar to automatic AED. I mean, the, um, similar to AED, automatic um, uh, defibrillator. But the, but, but, but the difference between the live vest and the, and the AED is that a second, process is, a second person's intervention is not required for the shock to be delivered. So that's really good. So if we have all of this uh, embedded in one specific device, how come would this device is not, is not widely used in this patient population? And this is what drove me into, um, into uh, conducting a, um, a qualitative study to kind of get the perspectives of the providers on why this device is not, um, is not widely used or is not as used as we should, I mean, as, as we envisaged. So in looking at literature, the viewpoints of providers on wearables in heart failure were very sparse, which means there weren't a lot of studies. There were not a lot of qualitative studies on the perspectives of the providers on regarding the use of um, wearables in heart failure. As at the time of that specific um, study, which was earlier this year, there were no study at all that that sought the, um, the views of the nurse practitioners. And, and because of the chronicity of the of, of heart failure, a lot of um, patients are being monitored or are being managed by nurse practitioners, but the nurse practitioner's perspectives are not being sought with regards to managing this patient. And so that kind of triggered my interest in wanting to know. And then, so, so then the purpose of, of, the, of my study really is, which is a qualitative study, is to explore the experiences of the nurse practitioners on the benefits and challenges of managing their patients with, uh, uh, with a wearable device like the live vest. So the specific aims were to answer a central question and sub-questions. Um, so the central question sought to examine the qualities that the live vest brings to, um, to patient care, which we as clinicians should endorse. And if there are features of the live vest that also may require modifications so that we can push um, you know, adoption but, um, through, um, through the patient's um, acceptance of the device. And of course, in doing that, it will, will um, I also hope to answer the sub-questions with regards to the benefits that the live vest can contribute to the decision, to clinical decision-making of the providers and also steps that we can take to, um, to address some of the obstacles um, to adoption. So in, um, <clears throat> In, 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 in seeking to understand this perspective, um, I use the theoretical framework of interpretative, uh, interpretive, in, interpret, interpretivism, which is interpretative uh, framework. So with the inter, inter, interpretative framework, it's, it's, tongue, it's tongue twisting, I'm sorry. With the interpretative framework, it's sought to, um, to kind of um, obtain information about the perception of the of the, of the nurse practitioners with regards to the nature of the live vest. And also their, 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 their knowledge, for, for us to seek knowledge of what the live vest does when they, um, to, the, to the care of the patient. And also the kind of values that these nurse practitioners attach to using the live vest to care for these patients. And finally, um, the methodology that was used to drive this interpretative framework was the direct face-to-face -face interview with these nurse practitioners to elicit their viewpoints on using the live vest to monitor uh, patients with heart failure conditions. So with regards to the conceptual framework, um, I used um, the theory of acceptance model. This theory was developed back in 1985 to, to understand the behavioral, the attitude and the behavioral intentions of technology users. And so if we look on the left side of my screen, there are like four, um, four variables there, which are the four, which are the, uh, the constructs of the TAM theory. And I, and I just use the abbreviation TAM. 
to refer to the theory of acceptance model. So um, in the temp um, model, there are two attitude concepts and there are two behavior concepts. The two attitude concepts um, relates to the perceived ease of use and the perceived usefulness, while the two behavior concepts um, relates to the intention to use and the actual use. So with regards to the attitude um, concept, we're looking at perceived ease of use. And this is defined by Davis back in 1985 as the extent to which a person believes that using a technology system involves minimal physical and mental effort. If I can just explain this in, in just plain, in plain words, it's basically saying that I will not use this device if it's, if it's too difficult for me to operate. And that's, and that's what, uh, and, and that's basically um, the, uh, what this concept is, um, is, is, is portraying. Then the, the other part of the, the, of the other part of the attitude concept is the perceived usefulness. And that is, is defined as the extent to which a user believes that using a technology will promote their performance. This, this definition came from Chung et al. back in 2019. And to explain this in the context of the, of the live vest is basically saying that, you know, um, if the live vest is not going to bring benefit to me, why put on this, I mean, this armor looking device? if it's not gonna bring benefits to me. And so um, with regards to the behavior um, concept, the intention to use is really the willingness for that person, for an individual to want to perform an action because that action has been perceived to be easy. And also the performing the action is also, um, will, will bring benefits to them. And so the, the final part of the, of the concept is the actual use, which means that once I intend to use this device, then the next step for me is to is to go ahead and and, and try it on and use the device. And, and so by using the, the device for a certain period of time, there is considered actual use, which is which now leads to eventual acceptance of that device as part of the treatment regimen for my condition. And that's the and that's the purpose of using this uh, conceptual framework. Now, with regards to literature review, I actually searched um, in a couple of um, databases like the CINAHL, Cochrane, ProQuest, PubMed, and PsycInfo. And out of the search, again, because, because literature on the, on, the, on the perceptions of providers that care for patients with wearable de uh, devices, well, I mean, were very sparse. Uh, I was able to get, you know, um, an info and I was also able to get um, those that were within the last five years. And so um, I came up with some of this, um, these studies right here. Now, the first one came out of New York where the cardiologists use um, a, fit, uh, a fitness app that um, in form of a wristband, which the patient will wear to collect information about the patient's um, um, physical and also their, um, their physiological um, data. And so at the end of the study, the cardiologist recommended through, the, through an interview um, when their perceptions were sought, they recommended the use of that device in, 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 uh, in, clinical, in clinical settings. Similarly, in Canada, there was another study on the perspectives of healthcare prof professionals or healthcare providers. And the healthcare providers, the H HCPs, healthcare providers in that settings included nurses, um, cardiologists and even um, you know um, internists, and so in that specific study, they looked at using mobile app to um, to monitor patients again patients um, you know um, medication uh, medication use and also their diets as well. And so when the perceptions of the healthcare providers were sought in a, uh, in a qualitative study, it was uh, positive. They express posit uh, positivity with regards to using mobile app to um, to monitor patients' um, diet and also uh, medication um, adherence. Thirdly, the the, uh, the the views of general practitioners were obtained on whether on the advantages and disadvantages of wearable devices in family medicine. This time um, in Switzerland, back in Europe, and so and again, the study yielded positive results where. The providers um, informed that the use of the of the devices actually help them to coordinate care better and also help them to communicate 
better amongst themselves and also with their uh, with the patients as well. Um, likewise, in Michigan, uh, back in 2019, a um, a study was also published um, on the perspectives of care primary caregivers and uh, advanced practice um, nurses on the use of technology in patient self care. This time, it's actually the patients who are using the device to collect data on themselves, such as their sleep, their sleep quality, the, um, you know, the sleep duration, and also um, the diets and their medications um, as well. So again, this brought positive um, expressions from the, uh, from the providers as well. Then uh, finally, the uh, physical therapists were also, their, their opinions were also sought or their perspectives were sought with regards to the use of technology. And this time it was also um, here in the US. It was, sorry, this time it was in Canada. And uh, the physical therapist there um, acknowledged the use of technology um, as being very beneficial, especially in patients who have problems with balance or gait. So they were able to use technology to successfully manage those patients. So with all of this literature review in mind um, that points positively to the use of technology um, in, in management of uh, patient's condition. That, um, that drove my, um, that drove my um, inquiry even further. And so the method that I use in, um, in, 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 in gathering the information actually um, relates, uh, I used an interview technique where I went in and interviewed um, nurse practitioners um, three nurse practitioners from a clinic, from a cardiac um, clinic in this in a um, in a metropolitan city here in the U.S. Um, the interview was semi-structured interviewed um, semi-structured interviews that covered about 40, forty-five to sixty minutes with each of the nurse practitioners, and it was and the um, the interviews were administered between March thirteenth and fifteenth of this year, twenty twenty-three. I also gathered field notes and also did audio recording. And so with regards to data analysis, um, the data were reviewed and manually transcribed, although I partially used um, NVivo software as well, uh, but I will, I, will, I, will speak about, I will speak to that in a second. Um, the responses were, code, were color coded uh, to identify recurrent patterns and a total of 23 initial codes were identified the codes were then exported into Microsoft Excel to create a code book. And the code book displayed the, co the codes, the definitions, and examples of the MP responses to some of the um to the um to the interview questions. So methodological rigor was established through um trustworthiness. And I used the um the the uh, Lincoln and Goober which is 1985 um, method of establishing trustworthiness of qualitative research findings. So which included credibility, confirmability, transferability, and also dependability. So with regards to the credibility, I was able to, um, to establish a trust building relationship with the MPs, particularly the MP gatekeeper, she, uh, who I happen to have worked with in the past, uh, as an informatic nurse specialist, I actually worked in that clinic before to help to um, to implement um, one of their um, a, a, a wrist a kind of a um, wrist band to collect um, uh, telemetry um, information. So I so this kind of build helped me to build the trust with the MPs through the gatekeeper um, to to kind of um, establish credibility. I also was able to establish credibility with with by developing a written script, which I used to minimize bias during the interview. With regards to confirmability, I was able to, um, to confirm, and we'll see that in a second as well, to confirm that the, the, the themes which, which were ex extracted from the responses of the, of the nurse practitioners aligned with the, theme, uh, with the, um, the theory of acceptance model um, constructs. And also with regards to confirmability, um, the reports of the analysis was shared by uh, was shared with the MP gatekeeper for member checking. I went back and I shared the um, the reports so that they can actually confirm that what I have um, interpreted in my uh, in the report was exactly their responses or their views. 
Um, and finally, with regards to conformability, I was able to get my peers to also um, provide in, to provide um, you know debriefing and also um, you know peer reviews and and also um, their own contributions to the drafts of the reports before I actually finalized the report. Then, with regards to transferability, I ensured that the direct quotes of the participants were included in my report, and we'll also see that um, in subsequent slides. Um, I used purpose, purposeful um, sampling uh, because the MPs were very experienced in taking care of this patient, so they were the sample that I used, and uh, also included a detailed report of the theme in my final report. With regards to dependability, I was able to um, to use consistent consistent coding um, responses from the from the participant. For example, the the um, I used Endivo software to kind of generate the um, the headings for each of the responses um, that the nurse practitioners um, you know um, presented I mean, gave to me during the interviews. And the similar and similar codes were merged were merged to create a theme and finally a code book and because of my expertise using technology to inform um healthcare um i actually was able to um to come in and um you know um to kind of um help the nurse practitioners to understand the um the relevance of using the live vest to um to kind of um interoperate with the um with the ehr system and i will also talk about that in a second um, so with regards to the ethical consideration, um, I stated the purpose and the benefits of their participation um, in, in, um, in, that, in, the, in the interview. And I also disclosed to them and explained to them um, the reason for, for the study. Um, I maintained confidentiality of the information by de-identifying information, um, de-identifying um, de -identifying personal information. So, so their names were not were not uh, were not included in the reports. I used um, you know um, kind of code to um, to to report who said what, and then the participants were also informed about the voluntariness of the of the of the study that it was voluntary and they could stop the interview at any point at any time. And I also observed um, writing standards um, throughout my reporting. So the results, in all, there were three themes and seven sub-themes that were generated. So the first theme speaks to the safety and cost um, implications of, of um, that impact life best. And so the sub-theme for that, or the sub-themes for that um, states that life vests offer protection to the patient. Life vests permit accessibility to care and life vests provide reassurance and patient engagement. The second theme, um, is administrative obligation, which really is not a benefit, it's like a kind of a burden, but because this is a qualitative study, I'm supposed to report everything, and that also, um, th that also demonstrates the credibility of the work that I did. So um, the providers were concerned that documentation requirement creates a burden for them, and also, they also had issues with device interface. The device interface issue that they, that they had really was that, um, the information that is gathered from the device um, resides on the on the designers or the or the vendors' websites. So when the doctors or the or the nurse practitioners need to document on the patient, they will need to log on to that portal first to retrieve the information and then come back to their EHR to document the same information. So it's like duplication of efforts, which kind of eats into their or which kind of um, interferes with their administrative, um, you know, um, their clinical time. So the administrative part interferes with their clinical time with the patient because they are busy documenting what's already documented in another system. So a good way would have been for to be an interoperability between their EHR and the and the and the um, uh, and the vendor's uh, portal, so that so that the information can be automatically uploaded instead of them having to retrieve it and to now um, duplicate it into their system. So the last or the third theme um, states that device appearance drive acceptability. Um, so one of the issues that it talked about, and we'll see some of the selected codes, I have selected codes on the next slide, um, where they, they said that the patient complained of the bulkiness or the size of the vest, that sometimes it's very, it's visible on the, underneath 
their their clothing that they're wearing something and that's so, with with some with some individuals the the wearing the life vest interferes with their life with their lifestyles some like to wear certain clothing and because it's actually going to be showing underneath they really stop by they had to stop buying those clothes or they had to change their wardrobe as well so that interferes with their lifestyle so if i just just to give examples of some of the selective quotes from the mps on safety mp mp number three stated that at rate at rate and rhythm are monitored and and ensuring that the patient does not go into a deadly rhythm and if they do the device delivers a shock and that's the safety part of the of the life vest on the cost the cost of the device is carried by the hospital system it costs about $10,000 for the duration of the use, about three months for those without insurance or partial coverage. So those who don't have insurance or who have partial coverage uh, can still have access to the um, to the vest and still be remotely monitored, um, even though they don't they don't have the money. But then the other part of it is that after the three months and they cannot afford it, then it's either the doctors take them off the vest or they, they will be stuck with the bill. On, on reassurance, MP number two stated that this uncertainty and the risk of death makes the patient, makes them anxious and afraid. So it becomes very positive when the provider informs the patient that using the vest has a purpose. So this actually, this, this three, um, the theme number one points to the perceived usefulness of the vest, which relates to the theme, I mean, which relates to the, um, to my conceptual model and also, um, the, the fact that the, that the um, uh, sorry, uh, the, perceived ease of, the perceived ease of usefulness is demonstrated here because if the patient is reassured that wearing the vest is going to save them from, uh, from sudden cardiac death, then it means that it is useful them to, for them to wear the vest. So thing two on documentation, the MP stated that um, it makes work, workflow heavier because providers has to document reasons for reordering and has to justify reasons for the patient's continuous use. In this case, this, this speaks to the perceived ease of use. They are saying that the ease of use is really not, I mean, it's not there because it makes their workflow heavier. So the concept of uh, the conceptual model is tested here. It's just tested, I mean, but, with, but um, the, the testing of it is not, is not positive because the, the provider sees it has been has been difficult to use, and then on the patient side, Dr. on the Dr. size, Dr. the MP number Dr. one. Dr. I'm sorry. You are out of time. Yes. <laughs> you are out of time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I am. Oh, it looks like it's 12:29. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to stop here. But uh, the rest of it is just a discussion and also the strength and the conclusion. So I'm just going to stop here. Uh, if there are any question or questions, um, I'm really um, willing to answer them.